Good day to you. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again. Let's oh. take a soothing sip of water. Ooh, that's nice. Lovely. Today I'm talking about Dave Mustaine because uh, he recently did an interview on the Joe Rogan podcast. I'm not sure if you guys have ever seen that one before. Um, but in this interview, he's discussing what it's like to survive the music industry. Um, so I'm going to watch a little bit of it and then uh, I'll pause it occasionally and talk to you about my own perspective. I'm sure it'll be fascinating. It usually is. Justin Hawkins rides again. <sighs> again. So just uh, some information about Dave Mustaine. I've already spoken about him recently because uh, there was a, a Megadeth release that I covered. Um, but he has released 15,000 studio albums. <laughs> Why for? He has released 15 studio albums with Megadeth, sold over 50 million albums worldwide, with six albums platinum certified, and he's won a Grammy Award for the Best Metal Performance in 2017. <sighs> Dave was the original uh, lead guitarist of Metallica, but he didn't appear on any of their recordings. Dave was originally born into a family of Jehovah's Witnesses, and he now identifies as a born-again Christian. He's been to rehab throughout his life, which makes it sound like he's always in rehab. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. I think periodically, at certain points during his life, he's probably been to rehab, as have many of us. He's fighting, fighting alcohol and drug problems, I and mean, he's also battled throat cancer in throat cancer in 2019. Let's have a little watch of this uh, interview because I think it's quite interesting to see how um, Joe Rogan is really has a laser focus on things like drug stuff and he really wants him to share some salacious tidbits about you know doing drugs and the rock and roll the rock and roll lifestyle I suppose. Do you think that the the drug and alcohol thing is the same today in music? Straight in with the drugs and alcohol thing. I think it's just not promoted by the, I mean how, what do you think the difference is between the influence of drugs and alcohol in the early days versus now? How far ago do you think Joe Rogan's talking about with the early days? Do you think he's talking about the 70s or the 60s maybe? 60s is he talking about flower power and, and marijuana and all that stuff and LSD? Because in the 70s it was heroin. Well, I think, I think in the early days of the music business. The early days of the music business, he must be talking about the, the 50s, 40s, 30s, 20s? No, he's talking about the beginning of the music industry. Like, music started off as a service. It was minstrels playing for kings and, you know, they were basically roaming peasants who had lutes and they were performing and they were providing a service and you'd pay them to entertain you momentarily. Then, with the advent of recorded music, it became a product, right? That's how the music trade went. And now we're regressing to the point where music is a service. It's a street, it's literally a service. You pay to be entertained um, or you, you know, you pay a subscription to you know, to a, a streaming platform of some sort, and then musicians are remunerated um, according to how much entertainment they've provided, right? It's that, isn't it? It's not, you're not selling records anymore. You might be selling T-shirts. I suppose there's still some commerce in that, that respect and product. But musicians are, are more or less t-shirt companies now that's the that's the main thing that's changed in terms of the actual business model but joe rogan seems to be really focused on how much drugs do people do and, and it's interesting that he says promoted you know what i mean like what when when were drugs ever promoted apart from when uh, the Beatles were singing about Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Well, I think, I think in the early days of the music business uh, first off the drugs weren't as strong the drugs weren't as strong really I, I always thought that the cocaine must have been much stronger in the 70s. Certainly in the 80s. Must have been. And uh, I think that the stigmatism for people about smoking is uh, less. A stigmatism is like when you're, one of your eyes is bulging and then you can't see properly. And I, I think that um, there's a lot of uh, 
other things that people use out on the road to, to cope with things that could be dealt with with you know good management, good good support system. Yeah, I think what Dave's referring to there is uh, the idea that um, with the stress and the rigors of, of road life, you are somehow using uh, illicitly obtained substances to self-medicate. Um, it's kind of hinting towards mental illness again, isn't he? Um, and and most importantly, you know, having somebody who's going to tell you the truth. You know, I'm, I'm a grown up. I'm a big boy. So when when I, I have stuff happen in my career, and um, it could have been avoided, or or somebody didn't tell me, and I find out later, that sucks. You yeah. Know? And and for a lot of people, when that stuff happens, they respond in a negative way with um, you know. Uh, either self sabotage or, or you know, they medicate themselves. Self sabotage is a brilliant system, though. I've done that myself so often. I really think it's um, that's definitely a coping strategy. Someone presents you with an opportunity, and you do your best to ruin it. It's just really good fun, isn't it? So it's a bit like when you, I think, if you play, if you play tennis, and it gets too easy, it's not, it's no, no fun anymore. So you start playing with a saucepan or with one hand behind your back, then it's more rewarding, isn't it? So the self-sabotage thing can happen for a lot of different reasons, partly to, you know, maintain the level of challenge. <laughs> I think once, um, you know, perhaps it's a complicated and nuanced area. And there's so many things in, in the music industry that, that um, you know, the, the history, the, uh, the, the people that you're working with, you know, a lot of people don't want to say anything bad about somebody. <laughs> That's not my experience. People love throwing each other under the bus, don't they? Because then it's not their fault anymore. Is that, That's a thing that people like to do, isn't it? I, I've never done it myself, obviously, but uh, other people did it. To me. But back in the 60s or 70s, what I was talking about, you know, different eras, different messes, different managers. You know, managers used to manage the mess. They don't manage the mess anymore. They don't want to tolerate that shit because there's always somebody around the corner that's ready to work harder than you. I think actually the experience of having a manager in, in, in America is a bit different to the one in England. Like in England, it's um, if you're a four-piece band, then the manager sort of usually represents the fifth member of the band. So um, your victories and uh, defeats uh, are suffered and shared together. Um, but in America, I think it's um, a slightly different vibe. Um, the risk factor is, is lessened because um, a manager, American managers, Americas, as I call them, take, uh, they usually take a percentage, a small, as a smaller percentage, but they take it off the top. So you know, the overheads and other things that you might incur by making really stupid decisions like flying over the audience in an arena tour. Those are expenses that you incur and they don't affect the amount of commission that the manager would take, you know, from the gig itself. Um, so they take a lesser lesser amount, but in a way it's, it's freeing for the artist because they can do whatever they want, it's their money. And, and the manager will enable them to do that. But I think in England, like the, a, ma a manager is more inclined to tell you not to do something like that because it would cost them and you. I think that's one of the reasons why, like a lot of, uh, you hear a lot of stories about American artists who go from rags to riches and then straight back to rags because they overtax men a lot of money and they get, they're ill-advised and yet their managers are driving around in, what's the American equivalent of a Bentley? They might still be driving around in Bentleys, I don't know in a really, really fancy car. Or oh, they're flying around in helicopters or something. Jetpack, I don't know. I that shit, because there's always somebody around the corner that's ready to work harder than you. Mm. It's like that motivational thing that Arnold said a long time. Somebody's out there getting stronger, running farther, you know, all that stuff. I love those motivational mm -hmm. tapes. Yeah, well, someone is out there doing it. And if you do fuck up and you want to just take Xanax all day and, and, and do coke and you don't write new music, someone's going to come along. They are. Well, I suppose, like, if it's a management stable, then you'd have, like, potentially a lot of acts that are in development, as it were. And then if you do kind of waste your opportunity and, and, and start doing all of the drugs uh, before you've done any of the actual, you know made any strides in the creative realm or had any sort of success, then I think you're probably going to get dropped. Um, I, d I don't think 
management sort of stables like that, they don't have the patience to develop artists in that way. Um, I think it's even worse with uh, labels, although I still think there's a little bit of a fascination about the about the drug culture. I can understand why Joe Rogan's going in hard on this angle, because I, I do think that um, the stigma of being a drug user um, hasn't manifested itself in a negative way in the music trade just yet. I still think there's a massive fascination with it. I think sex, drugs and rock and roll, despite all of the pitfalls of those things, um, I still think it's a fascinating... I think people are still looking for it. I mean, when I say people, I mean labels, actually. I think if they, I think there's so much politeness and homogenised, watery music around that anything that has an edge is more appealing. And unfortunately, it's a tightrope because it's a dangerous way to live your life. Um, it plays into that whole thing of like a short-term thinking because it's bad for it's bad for the health of the creative individual. But I still think that there's an unspoken fascination with it you know look at um for example pete doherty that wasn't that long ago that his whole career and more or less everything that everybody thought they knew about him was based on his drug use and i think more so than his music i mean i love uh i love the fact that he's transferred his addiction now to cheese and walking his dog and he's happy it's brilliant, he's managed to survive it. He's definitely a legit rock and roll survivor. But I don't think he got the support he probably would have benefited from back in the day, because I think people liked watching the car crash and it was part of his appeal as an, as an artist. Isn't that a part of like the whole rock and roll mystique? A part of the whole mystique was the guy who did crazy drugs, was kind of half out of it, but would go on stage and be brilliant. I think it's also, it's not just music though, it used to be the same in sports as well. People used to marvel at, uh, what was that um, racing car driver? James Hunt, Oliver Reed. It's not just the creatives. Sometimes, you know, that's yeah. Keith Moon, you know, yeah, that's that worked for Keith. But uh, I think that's, uh, you know, a player like Keith is so all over the place. You know, he doesn't have a song with a pattern, so right. it's just go out there and, and just hit everything. I would say there's a bit more to uh, Keith Moon's playing than that. He wouldn't do well in Megadeth because I think you do need to have a certain level of discipline to play that type of metal. But um, he was pure energy, wasn't he? You know, we, we try and, and uh, associate with people that are like-minded with us, you know, the people that are uh, about their careers and that really are uh, into taking care of themselves um, Two of the guys in Five Finger Death Punch do jiu-jitsu. They have a, a sensei out with them. We I think they do jiu-jitsu against each other, though. Like, isn't there a danger that when they're doing all those holds and throws and things that they might break their fingers and stuff? When you go on a metal tour, do you pack like the really skin-tight black jeans, black T-shirt with a band's name on it, um, and then like a, a jiu-jitsu um, apron, whatever it is? <laughs> A throwing apron. What do they have? So we try and hang out with bands that are really uh, health centric, you know, that right. are really, really looking into and not just from here down, but here up too. Not just from the waist down, but also from the neck up, the middle bit there. There's a documentary on uh, Apple TV called uh, 1971, the year that music changed everything. Have you guys seen that? You seen it? It's really amazing. It's really interesting because it's a lot of it is about. <sighs> how like um, the drugs of choice um, changed. I think a lot of it's about, I, I haven't seen it for a little while, but I think a lot of it's about heroin and the influence of heroin on things like, you know, the Rolling Stones. And how everything got darker and the 70s was, wasn't about flower power anymore. It all changed. I suppose the 80s was decadence and capitalism shoulder pads, cocaine, 90s, you're back to heroin. <laughs> you know, I feel like it's, um, it goes cocaine, heroin, cocaine, heroin. It's the, it's the never ending cocaine, heroin, cocaine, heroin, jujitsu, cocaine, heroin, the unending 
battle for supremacy between the three, the holy trinity of cocaine, heroin and jiu-jitsu. So in summary, I think nobody gets into the music trade because of a fascination with, with drugs. But I think it can be quite an effective, um, unfortunately, it can be quite an effective uh, marketing approach. Um, I would say that there's a lot of examples in recent years of people whose careers have gone much further than you would expect them to go on account of, uh, you know, a curious <laughs> fascination with the world of drugs. Um, but also, it's so... I mean, I just don't think that they're... I, I mean, I know we're talking about um, the experiences um, as relayed by Dave Mustaine here, but um, there are so many people who have died, and you've seen it, and you can see it coming a mile off. You know, nobody, surpri nobody was surprised when um, Amy Winehouse died, for example. People are more surprised that uh, Pete Doherty survived. That's, that's the surprising part of it. But I think we're quite happy to sort of stand around and, and, and watch those things unfold for better or worse, or wh whichever way around it goes, and then go, well, told you. So I, I knew that was going to happen. And then just dismiss it as a trope of the music trade. So it's always brilliant when somebody comes out and says, well, look, this is how it is. It's dangerous because of this. Um, and being open about their problems. It's difficult to be explicit about these things, um, but it's it's great that uh, Dave Mustaine was prepared to have a conversation about it at all. So well done, Dave. I think we should try and support each other, really, because it's uh, there are pitfalls, and uh, even if you see them coming, it doesn't make them any easier to traverse. Justin Hawkins rides again, again. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Watch one of these two videos, and uh, that's it.